Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Today's webinar on best practices for developing a community-led ECBO board. Um, I'm going to wait a little bit for people joining to this webinar, uh, but we're going to start soon. Thank you so much for joining today. Hey, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining today's webinar on best practices for developing a community-led ECBO board. Um, ECBO stands for Ethnic Community-Based Organizations, and uh, we are really excited to see you all today on this webinar. Um, we're going to go over some quick tip um, and then your setting about this Zoom webinar. Here is a quick overview of your setting in Zoom. This is a Zoom webinar. So you are joining on listen only mode. And due to the large number of learners on today's webinar, we've disabled the chat box. However, you do have the option to send messages to the speakers and co-facilitator via the Q&A button right there. And keep eye on the chat from the message, um, chat for messages from Switchboard team and link to the various resources we'll be mentioning throughout. And today's webinar will run for 90 minutes and it's being recorded. You will receive an email with the recording slides uh, within 24 hours. And the webinar transcript along with the recording will also be posted on the web, um, Switchable website within the following days. And last, we ask that you kindly complete our webinar satisfaction survey at the conclusion of our session today. This short three question survey help us here at the switchboard continuously improve our training and technical assistance offering to you all. Thank you so much again for joining today. And next, um, we would like to introduce um, today's speaker. I'm really happy to be here with an amazing speaker today. Um, first of all, Josela Mugorera is an international best-selling author, award-winning speaker, and a founder of the Diversity in Action Global Movement, which coaches CEOs who are committed to championing diversity in action raised in Rwanda, Africa. Josela earned a position as a country's director of agriculture, becoming a member of parliament and government brought her opportunity to promote the cause closest to her heart, the human rights and gender equality. Later, her safety is in jeopardy and Josela fled Rwanda beginning life anew as a refugee in Knoxville, Tennessee. She eventually became the executive director of the Bridge Refugee Services, the agency that had invested on her. Now a business coach and international speaker, Josela shares her powerful story of uh, perseverance and optimizing adversity and cultivating diversity in action. She strives to empower refugees and immigrants and highlight the incredible contributions these newcomers bring to our communities. Thank you, Josela. And next speaker is Doda. Doda Sise is the National Network Director at African Community Togethers, ACT, the founder and executive director of the Louisiana Organization for Refugees and Immigrants, LORI, and vice chair of the Refugee Congress Board of Directors. A former refugee, Doda fled Sierra Leone at age 16 due to a brutal war. He became the first refugee to serve as U.S. advisor at the UNHCR high-level officials meeting on the Global Compact on Refugees and a new old tripartite consultations on resettlement. In addition, he was among the first advisor to serve the U.S. Refugee Advisory Board. At the local level in Baton Rouge, he is part of the Mayor Sharon Weston Bloom's International Relations Commission and is a chairperson of the Commission on Culture and Art Engagement. 
daughter is a recipient of the 2021 Refugee Congress Excellent Award for Honor Honorary Delegate and the ACT Coffee Annan Award. He holds a degree in Applied Science in Process Technology and is pursuing his bachelor's degree in Administrative Management. Thank you so much, Doda, for joining today. And um, next speaker is Clara. Clara Timsina is a co-founder and executive director of the Bhutanese Community Association of Pittsburgh, BCAP. He was born in Bhutan and lived in a refugee camp in Nepal for nearly two decades before coming to the U.S. in 2009. He served on the Racial Equi Equity Subcommittee on COVID Vaccination in Governor Tom Wolfe's Office of Advocacy and Reform and was a co-chair of Allegheny uh, County, sorry, um, DHS Immigrants and International Advisory Council for three years. Mr. Timsina was uh, one of eight refugee leaders nationwide to be recognized by the Obama administration in 2017 for his contribution to making the U.S. more welcoming by serving his fellow refugees in Western Pennsylvania. He actively engages local municipal officials in the Pittsburgh area, advocating for educating his community. And last speaker is myself. Um, I'm now Kabashima and a co-founder and executive director of the Karen Organization of San Diego. Uh, Karen Organization is a partner of Switchboard. Um, she is originally from Japan, first came to the United States as a graduate student after earning her master's degree in political science from California State University, Chico. She began volunteering for the Refugee Resettlement Program at Jewish Family Service of San Diego, where she met with many Karen and Karen refugee family. In 2009, she co-founded KOSD with Karen community leaders to meet the urgent need of refugee from Burma in San Diego. She became KOSD's executive director in 2011, and I'm currently work with um, 15 coworkers, amazing coworker. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And I'm really excited to be here with um, this amazing three speaker with me today. Okay, I'm gonna go over the learning objectives for today. By the end of this session, you'll be able to identify key elements of successful community-led board development and name at least one new practice or strategy for community-led board development to implement at your ECBO and describe strategies to connect with other leaders to learn more about best practices and relevant resources for community-led board development. Okay, uh, since this is a webinar and um, it's this an only mode for you, we wanted to learn about you a little bit more. Um, if you have ever done this Slido, um, go ahead to start doing that. If you've never done this before, you use your cell phone and then you know you take try to take picture of this QR code and then go to that Slido question page. And I really appreciate if you can answer to these questions. We just want to know who you are. And um, yeah, great. Thank you, everyone. Since today's uh, theme is about um, community-led board development for ECBO and ECBO sustainability, I expected to have many people from ECBO, of course, and then, yeah, we do have about 30%, but we have a lot of people from resettlement agency. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we have some uh, people from the federal, state, local government agency, other service providers, and some community members. Um, yeah, this is actually really good because we always wanted to work with other partners. Um, resettlement agency is definitely an important partner for us and other service providers and government agency. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, doing the Slido questions. And yeah, going up, but I think it's ready to go to our main part of the webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, now I'm very excited to welcome Josella. Josera, thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you uh, now and uh, get your pen and papers ready because there is a lot of uh, things in store for you from these amazing speakers now just said. Uh, a little bit about me more about what's now said. Uh, last year, 2022 in June, I was um, 
an executive director for Bridge Refugee Services, which is the resettlement agency that welcomed me in 2009 as a refugee. And I felt a calling. I felt a calling to expand uh, my expertise to empower refugee and immigrant leaders like you and also uh, working with African-Americans in the police departments so I can extend my knowledge, but I want to help you also to not delay while I delayed so you can uh, be excellent leaders. Today's topic is about the community-led board development. So what make it successful? On the la la next slide, we will refresh our memory and talk about board of directors. Who are those people? The board of directors is a governing body for an organization. They ensure that the organization have what it needs to carry out its mission. And they do this in a legal way. So they have to be compliant with legal. Uh, and then they can do it ethically in, in, many, in, a, in a manner which is effective for everyone. So um, for the next slide, we will talk about the nonprofit responsibilities, which they share with uh, community-led boards, uh, but we will see what extra the ECBO's boards are bringing on the table. The first responsibility is to establish organizational policies. Among these are like employee policies, accounting and financial policies, but also they do establish the bylaws for the board itself. They set the direction. They are directors, you know? They set the direction for the organization and they plan for the future. Because when you are a leader, you want the sustainability, the, the sustainability for the organization. They just not think about today, but how about tomorrow and after tomorrow and years to come. They oversee finances and fundraising, and they are care they care also about resource development because if you don't have enough resources, you cannot carry on your organization. One of the role they do is uh, the roles they do is supporting and supervising the executive director. I have witnessed some board of directors who focus more on the control. But as you know, the executive director has a lot of responsibility and they need that support. And then they have to supervise that executive director and support them. And then conduct onboarding development. Development is needed, not only on the board, but on staff in, in our community. It's key, essential. On the next slide, now we will talk about ECBO's board. What do they do on the top of what I just said? They bring lived experience, which is huge. You, most of you are in that category. You have experience from being a refugee or being a, a, an immigrant, and you know what it takes to help others in the same condition to move forward. They have in depth about the community knowledge. So they know about their communities and they have to carry and uh, uh, take care of their needs. They have higher expectations from their community they serve. As you know, many of the people you serve, they don't speak English or English is not their first language. So you need to go extra miles to find resources to help them. They help, they have a role in building community capacity. So we all need capacity to move and progress and prosper. This is essential role the ECBO's board members are bringing in their communities. Also, they need extra time and resources like interpretation services, translation services, so everybody can be participating in the discussions, but also in the programs. On the next slide, we will talk about what is a community-led board development. It is a process because we keep building and building. It is a process in which a governing board of an organization, typically a nonprofit or community-based organization, is developed and guided by 
active participation, inputs, and influence from the broader community it serves. We need great ideas from people we serve. In French, they say, autant de tête, autant de day. Many herds have many ideas. We need to learn and hear every community member we serve. So we have to be good listener and participate, uh, uh, contribute to their goals. On the next slide, we will talk about the core values, uh, about how ECBO's board are guided by these core values. The number one is empathy. You have to know and acknowledge the needs of your community and their concerns. So you have to take enough time to assess what they need so you can plan for the future programs. Sustainability, we want organization that will last for long, even when we're not be here. We want our children, our grandchildren and our great grandchildren, even those we will not see to say, hey, mom, auntie, this leader built this organization and then I have to carry on. And I applaud you, some of you also are teaching your children the languages so they can even help people, uh, the elders in our community who are needing those children in, uh, in interpretation. Community ownership is a great core value because when you have community that have ownership in your programs, they will support the program. And this is another key area that will lead to the sustainability because all the people in the community are on the same level of understanding of the programming and everything will go smooth when they work together so they can sustain the organization. Learning and growing. Who wants to, to grow? All of us. And learning is a process. Our community and board members, all of, the, all, all of us have to grow so we can go towards the sustainability we are talking about. Inclusivity is crucial because we want to be the representation of every ethnic group we are uh, serving, the ages, gender. We, we need all the perspective, the background, the experience and expertise. When we have all this together, that mosaic contributes to the success of our organization. Collaboration, they say that collaboration is the new currency. Collaboration within uh, the board uh, of directors members, but also collaboration with external partners and collaboration with our clients, the one we serve is key. Empowerment. So we were empowered to empower others. Without empowerment, people will be stagnant and they will not grow themselves or will not grow our organization. This is why it's crucial to have an empowerment plan within the board, but also for the people we serve. Adaptability and flexibility are like twins. You know, COVID showed up. We didn't expect that. So how do we adapt to do the new situation? Today you have ORR funding. What do you do if you don't have funding from ORR? So you have always to work on adaptability strategies so you can sustain your organization. So what are, on the next slide, we will talk about the prerequisite for an effective community-led organization. So number one, Commitment from the board members. If you are not committed, you cannot be a good leader. It takes courage to accept that responsibility, but also it takes commitment. And you are not alone. When you commit to do the responsibility you are uh, entitled as a board member, you have other people. It's a shared uh, collaboration. It's a shared responsibility. Everybody, if everybody is committed, so you are assured that the results will get where you want them to be. Resourceful, being resourceful is a, a prerequisite because either board members, either staff have to be resourceful because as you know, I was talking about of the needs of our communities. So you have to find a way, not only resource in the region, 
but you have to network with other people so you can know where are other resources. There is an idiom in my country saying that when the birds do not fly to find where other nectar is, so they will not survive. So leaders like you also uh, have to be able to find extra resources wherever they are so they can sustain their organization. Visibility matters. You cannot be a success uh, while you are not visible. So board members have to be ambassadors of the organization in your locality, online, everywhere. Because when you are more visible, when you share what you do, many people, you will shine and many people will see what you do so they can support you. Storytelling. I always say that the stories, our stories are our intellectual property. And you have heard that story sell. You can share statistics. They will tell the story, but the stories will tell. Many people's hearts are touched and changed because of the stories of impact you are making in our community. Networking and building relationships. They say it's about who you know. And they also say that the, your network is your net worth. And building relationships can lead you to wherever you want to be. So I engage and I like every one of you to expand your network and help your board members. I, imagine if we can leverage all the networks every board member has how we can find more resources to sustain our organization. So now let's go and move to the main challenges. One of uh, the biggest challenge we, we face is board burnout because we require more from them and they, they, they work out of the clock. Sometimes we feel like you are working 24 seven because of the community needs. In some of uh, organization I belong to and uh, on ECBO's calls, people talked about also questioning about having an honorarium. But as you know, the laws governing the nonprofit organization do not allow uh, any benefits. But there is a way to help board members, like if they go for conferences and other businesses related to uh, uh, the organization they are leading, if they don't cannot afford and the organization can afford that, they can help them to attend those conferences because they will go and uh, represent the organization and bring some good nuggets from there. Balancing inclusivity and efficiency. Sometimes we think, yes, we need representation uh, from our community members, but as we say, there is a skill gap. We have to, to find a way to, uh, to, to bridge. As an example, I am a member of the National Refugee Congress organization. We say that we need the delegates in our, as board members, but we realized that there were skills they were lacking. And then we expanded 50% of the, the, the representative being from other uh, uh, people who have a refugee experience and that bridged the gaps. The skill capacity and the capacity gaps are uh, an issue many organizations are uh, reporting, but there is always a way how we can fill that gap. The lack of communication and budget infrastructure. As we know, many of our clients speak different languages. We have to be able to provide interpretation services in person, but also I would advise you to have like a backup, like online, uh, translation. So the budget for that should be there. And if you are not there yet, probably it's something you can build in in your, your uh, next fiscal year or the years to come. But the budget is uh, something, uh, the financial problems is something that keeps coming and coming and coming over. But I tell you, one tip I can give you from today, who has my money? Make a list of the foundation, of the corporations, of other nonprofit who can give you money to do the programs. Money is everywhere, but we have to be strategic in accessing those uh, resources. So the fundraising capacity, if you don't have a development um, uh, director, I would advise to have one because fundraising is key. And also I would advise that in your newsletter, you keep sharing the stories. The power dynamic 
is an issue. Sometimes our leaders feel like they are not trained, they are not educated, but they are opinion leaders. They have a lot to contribute to. So we have to educate them about, feel confident about their contribution and their knowledge. And uh, before I will pass um, this to uh, now, I want to talk about effective community-led best practices for addressing the challenges adjustment ma made. Continue to build the trust among board members, the staff and the people we serve because trust is like the cement. If you don't have trust in your organization, it can break up. So trust will be the foundation of everything you are doing. You can develop the process for addressing conflicts. Conflicts are normal and they help us to grow. In my culture, in Rwandan culture, they say, when we have people, you have humanism, humanism around those people. So uh, having the mechanism to uh, manage those conflicts is key for uh, as a best practice to address those challenges. Recognize the talents uh, and the commitment for board members. You know they are volunteers, but they do need recognition like all of us. When you have a volunteer appreciation week, remember to appreciate uh, your board members. And remember also to appreciate your executive director, but also the staff members. Because most of the time we think about who do we serve the clients and sometimes we can forget about our staff. They need to be recognized too. You create a mechanism of accountability. Everybody should be accountable for what they do, for the funding they manage, but for your staff, your clients, but also we should be accountable to uh, our donors. So remember that because the more you are accountable, the more people trust you and they can keep sustaining you. Then pay attention to results because when you have results, even if you feel like you are failing, you are you are failing forward. So it's even if you don't get to the results you want, it's a learning experience. Learn from it and plan forward what you can do. Because when you learn from those results, that helps you for the strategic planning for the years to come. Last not least, be flexible. In our case, we are having people who have different kind of problems and challenges in family. If you have, for example, a board members with small children, you have to say, hey, if they come on, on, on in a meeting, do you have a babysitter who is there? If there is a sickness, how you work on a calendar of the meeting so everybody can participate comfortably without uh, any gaps in your, your planning and execution. So now I think, now I'm to the point to give you, take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yosera. Um, we learn a lot. And um, now that we learn about the unique challenge for the ECBO board and some best practices for addressing challenges, we wanted to hear from ECBO leaders uh, from their experiences. And um, first of all, I wanna uh, invite Doda here. He is the executive director of Louisiana Organization for Refugees and Immigrants. And after that, I'm gonna invite Kara from the Bhutanese Community Association of Pittsburgh. Doda. It's... Thank you so much, Doda. Um, thank you so much. Um, now, and kudos to Gwes and Drusella for your powerful opening and and then your remarks. Yes, um, once again, my name is Dauda um, Sisi and the founder and also the executive director at Louisiana Organization for Refugees and Immigrants. And I'm also the national network director at African Communities Together and vice chair refugee Congress. But I wore so many hearts. But today, um, I really wanted to talk to you about Lori, the Louisiana Organization for Refugees and Immigrants. An organize as one of the few organizations that is led and built by refugees, asylees, and vulnerable migrants in the state of Louisiana. And the leaders of the Louisiana Organization for Refugees and Immigrants, Lori for short, 
have not just the lived experience, but also the expertise and, and understand the unique challenges the community face, especially after you resettle, shut out the language barriers, adapting to a new way of life. And due to this lived experience, we came together to share our expertise, provide support, and help each other go through emotional crisis. And, and with our mission to assist refugees and immigrants throughout their various stages of integration in Louisiana and other states, enable them to become self-reliant. On the next slide, um, Lori established in 2017 as a voluntary organization to promote the well-being of refugees. Over the years, we have not only grown from a voluntary-led group to a professionally staffed organization serving hundreds of refugees each year. Our board structure has also evolved <laughs> from um, to nine board members, which six are refugees, asylee, uh, or an immigrant as part of our board. And then also the board has also moved from a um, from a um, from a working board to a governance board with a specialized committee focusing on areas like finance, development, and programming. And also, currently, we have directly taught the lives of over 35 nationalities and ethnicities. What does this symbolize? It symbolizes our dedication to diversity and inclusion. And Lori has not only goals in numbers and outreach, but it also has grown in impact as well. And as you can see, our programs and activities has, in, um, has increased to advocacy, civic engagement, immigration legal aid, and economic empowerment. Through our immigration legal aid, we have assisted over 50 individuals with their immigration legal cases and we've helped reunite families as well. And then also, we have risen to meet the emergency needs to providing food and basic necessities to over 100 families impacted by natural disaster. And we all know our state, Louisiana, it is prone to natural disaster when it comes to hurricane, flooding, and freeze. And then also during COVID-19, we're able to distribute thousands of emergency cash and rental assistance to refugees and immigrant families. On the next slide. So now we're gonna talk about board development and challenges that we face. And then we all know that one challenge that we face is balancing the needs for special skills and representations with the desire to have a board that is representative of the community we serve. For example, we found it challenging to recruit board members or refugee community leaders with specific skills in finance and legal affairs. To address this, we provide scholarship and opportunity for our immigrant community and leaders to do the comprehensive overview of immigration law, which is short for call. And as I speak, we got two of our members that have now DOJ accredited to practice immigration law. So we are not just only talking about the challenges, we came up with solution how we can solve those challenges. We are also providing support to board members to develop new skills. And also we moved on to recruit board members in other outside of the refugees and immigrant communities, because we know that to address um, 
critical issue we need an holistic approach and also to strengthen and deepen our collective effort so we in within our board we include as well local residents on the next slides now we are not just recruiting and when we are recruiting board members one thing that we know that is mentorship program it is very crucial to have that knowing that the board members, the new board members, and the old board members able to train the new board members so in order to adapt. And as well as for the non-refugees and immigrants, but really, really allies to our cause, we provide that mentorship as well. Representation, like our previous speaker mentioned, it is key and very crucial because we wanted to ensure that the board it's a representative of the community we serve, skills and expertise. That is one thing that we pay close attention to. And then we can see the transformation of Lori and the impact that we have got is because of when we recruit on the board, we have to make sure that it's not just the lived experience, but they get the, have a mix of skills and expertise on the board to effectively, effectively govern the organization and provide strategic directions. Collaboration. And as I mentioned, it is key. Collaboration is very key because fostering a collaborative and supportive board culture where all members feel valued and represented. And what does that does that it brought an effective commitment where board members feel that they are part of this organization, they own it, and then they will give their best. And that has transformed to the many lives that we have charged here in Louisiana. And that has led to us creating a more diverse and inclusive communities today in Louisiana. So with that, I thank you all for your attentions and I will pass it on um, to now again. Thank you so much, Doda, for sharing about Lori. Uh, before moving to uh, Kara's presentations, I wanted to remind you about Q&A future. Uh, since we have too many uh, people joining today, which is really great, uh, and then our time is limited, we are using the Q&A button uh, for your questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use that feature and then leave your questions so that we can answer to your questions. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you so much, everyone. And then I now invite Kara uh, from the Bhutanese Community Association of Pittsburgh. Thank you so much, Kara. No, thank you so much. Uh, I'm honored to be speaking uh, along with this uh, uh, very uh, experienced uh, non-profit world workers. Um, so to reintroduce myself, I'm Kara Timsina. I'm the executive director here at BCAP, Bhutanese Community Association of Pittsburgh. I'm sure by now you have uh, seen uh, our mission statement. So I'm not going uh, to read uh, the mission statement. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to follow on the slides that come on the screen first. And then um, I have uh, four tips uh, for those uh, among us who might be uh, wondering how to begin a community uh, nonprofit organization, or uh, if there are any one among us uh, who is thinking of helping a refugee community in your respective uh, places, um, assisting them uh, how to begin their community organization. Uh, and these tips are based on the experiences um, I have worked with. So I'm one of the co-founders um, uh, and, um, and um, the, the organization was founded by um, all uh, former Bhutanese refugees from Nepal. Uh, the next slide um, will be all, all the information that um, we all give um, as representatives from the organization. So we were established in 2012 uh, to support our own community. Um, but then um, as time passed, we opened our doors uh, serving uh, many other refugee and immigrant groups that uh, have come to live in our neighborhoods. Uh, in 2014, two years after our founding, we received um, the non, um, I mean, the um, 513 status. And it was the same year, uh, the same, around the same time, we, we were 
lucky to receive the ORS ethnic self-help uh, grant. And that gave our first office. Um, currently we are, uh, we have 13 board members, but uh, this, uh, this has been an expansion since our founding. We were initially um, seven, then we raised to nine, to 11, to 13. As the population grew, we wanted to make sure that uh, all our neighbors, neighborhoods uh, were represented um, well in the board. And, and one speciality about our organization is we have, we have let the youth and women uh, take ownership and take uh, the, the steering wheel of the organization. Some of the programs um, that we do, um, we, our, our main program for now is youth programming. Um, and, and then because we have seen a lot of uh, suicide cases from our community, uh, mental health support uh, became another uh, main focus of our work. Um, and then we have been doing this um, uh, since our inception, providing immigration assistance. And then civic engagement has been our work uh, since then and uh, continues today. Next slide, please. Um, so challenges. Um, initially, uh, when people were still new, um, you, you know, we, we faced um, a situation when uh, some of the folks who expressed interest uh, to work on the big cap board, but uh, they had the, the expectation that uh, they would be paid. And then we all know in a nonprofit world, board members are, are not paid. So that was a challenge in uh, the recruitment. Uh, what the other challenges we face is uh, uh, the communication between uh, the executive director and board members. This is very uh, crucial. And this came up um, in the introductory part from Rosella. Um, lack of knowledge of standard functions and responsibilities board led to quitting. So when uh, individuals um, you know, jump in to serve and then do not have uh, sufficient knowledge of uh, you know serving a nonprofit uh, board, then they 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 feel some kind of embarrassment and they quit. That is one of the challenges in the board deployment. Next, next slide, please. So um, our best practice we have followed is uh, you know uh, give ample opportunity for youth leadership uh, and encourage uh, our women to participate in leadership. Um, and then uh, board members with time and skills um, were, you know, uh, carefully selected. So those uh, who came with skills, they shared their skills. Though, uh, those who could um, share experiences, they did that um, and some um, helped with the financial part. And then we also made it um, uh, some kind of an understanding that all board members are supposed to make their annual contribution. And this is working well. Uh, we also know that board members need some kind of uh, um, you know energy in between. So um, once a year, we uh, we do some kind of uh, recognition for the board members, um, and then um, I, I do say I we have a very good communication uh, myself with the board chair and with the board members. Next, please. All right. So uh, before um, I, I let um, the microphone go to now, uh, I had promised four tips. So and those are identify and gather key community members and suggest a meeting to discuss first steps. It is helpful if someone is the chair. Second, ask a local refugee resettlement other, or other kind of immigrant refugee serving organizations to help identify a local university graduate school in public affairs or public administration or social work. They will be very helpful uh, to assist you in the beginning. Uh, third tip is come up with a mission, purpose, name, simple bylaws, uh, officers, and help in filing papers and developing a simple strategic plan. Also an outline for grant proposals would be great. Uh, the next one is learn about foundations, businesses, and banks where you can ask for funding. Funding is crucial that we all know. So um, that, that's another step. And finally, always keep your community engaged all along your way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kara. And thank you, Dora, again. Um, you're amazing. And then, um, yeah, I learned a lot too. 
Um, again, if you have any questions to today's speakers, please use our Q&A button in the bottom sections and then leave your questions. I believe that we have enough time to go over some of the questions um, and we can ask our speakers to answer to your question directly um, or some questions might be answered by um, typed answer. Uh, but again, um, please use the Q&A feature if you have any questions. Now, um, after hearing from the ROWI and a VCAP, there are challenges and best practices. I would like to speak a little bit about Korean organization of San Diego. Uh, I'm really happy to be um, executive director of this amazing organization and then um, and in the community. And um, next slides. Um, I will go over um, about the basic about the QSD. Uh, we started this organization in 2009 to meet urgent needs of refugees from Burma, resident in San Diego. Um, I'm the one of the funders, but I uh, work with uh, Karen refugee leaders um, to start this organization together. And then this was our community's effort, not only the leaders, but also um, the families uh, from Burma, from Karen community. Um, got together to start these organizations. And now um, our organization is serving anybody who are from Burma um, and are working with many different ethnicity, uh, ethnic groups from Burma. And um, even though we started this organization in 2009, it took um, about two years until we get the first ever grant, which was from the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, the federal grant um, from the OR Ethnic Community Self-Help Grant was our first ever grant that we ever got. And because of that, we are able to start hiring, hiring staff members, and then also got our office space in 2011. And we stayed the same space for our community. I'm so proud that we are able to keep this door open still, thanks to um, many different funders and supporters. And we have 11 board members and seven of them are refugee board member from different ethnic groups, Karen, Kareni, Kaching. Um, and now we have 16 staff member, paid staff members, and 14 of them are from the community. Uh, they speak Karen, Burmese, and Karenian languages, and are working really hard for the community every single day. Our main programs are case management, community education, support groups for um, women, parents, and seniors, and youth. We have a youth program, civic engagement, and economic development. Next slide, please. Um, our challenges, I'm going to talk about our board structure uh, later at the best practice part, but um, we have been um, difficulty recruiting youth board members. And the one reason is because of the culture of current culture and then the culture of ethnic group from Burma, respecting elders and then respecting voices of elders. And um, so when we are sitting together, the younger uh, generation sitting together um, with the older generations and then leaders of the community, I, it's been really hard for them to share the true idea, like honest opinions. Um, and so that's the one reason that it's been having difficulty uh, recruiting youth board members. And then when I was hearing the Kara's, um, you know, BCAP, they have a youth uh, board members, that's amazing. and. Um, but uh, for that issue that we started to work with Youth Advisory Committee, we made it an uh, official Youth Advisory Committee about two years ago, and our uh, younger generations are sitting in the committee and a meeting uh, to discuss about the issue in the community, and then our staff and board members, if we have any questions to the younger generations, um, to decide the direction of the organizations or new programming. This, um, the Youth Advisory Committee is a great space for us to uh, get that idea from younger generation. And lack of a culturally and linguistically inclusive board training, this being another challenge for us. We do have many board members that who don't speak English well or read um, well. And, um, you know, I know that there's a lot of great training for board members, uh, but most cases um, they are done in English or other languages and they are not able to offer um, Korean or Burmese type of interpretation. 
And maybe, you know, individualized training might be available, but it is costly. Um, so that's been our challenge in communication between refugee board members and supportive board members uh, is another challenge that I call a supportive board member here uh, for that non-refugee community board members in our uh, board of directors. Um, but when we have uh, some language issue um, and when many of our refugee board members don't use email as a communication tool, it's been um, some challenge, but uh, we being, you know, our staff members being helping us to relay the message. Um, and then also we try many uh, kind of impersonal meeting and then um, kind of social, um, you know, mixers for the um, refugee board members and no refugee board members so that they feel more comfortable communicating each other. But uh, still, this remain our challenge. Um, next, I'm gonna talk about our best practices. We try uh, many, many different way after we started our organization in 2009. And then especially after getting that funding from OR, we have um, like a legal kind of commitment that we really have to have community board members um, on our board. And then not just for you know the purpose of getting funding, but we believe that community-led board is critical for us to be a true um, community-based organization, ethnic community-based organization for refugees from Burma. And then, uh, so we try many different ways. And now um, we have a structure, um, like our own structure uh, to govern this board. Um, so now we have a community and supporter board. Um, we have an entire board, but we have a sub kind of committee of refugee board members and non-refugee board member. We are uh, entire board are meeting um, every other month, but other um, each subcommittee are meeting also every other month. So that um, we are having um, different board meeting every month. And what we do is um, we have a co-officer system meaning uh, we have a co-chairs, we have a co-secretary and a co-treasurer. Uh, one co-chair is from the refugee community and then one uh, co-chair is from non-refugee uh, board members. And then this is the way that we do kind of the mentoring, like uh, Lori uh, Dora was sharing that board mentorship programs, but this is the way that we mentor our board members, uh, not just the community board members, but also non-community board members. Um, for example, uh, our community board members may be, um, you know, um, this is the first time for them to serve the board of the nonprofit organization in the United States. And then it is might be difficult for them to truly understand that um, the legal perspective of a nonprofit management um, kind of perspective, but then uh, our non-refugee community board members can kind of mentor our refugee board members for sitting on the same officers, um, same office. And then also um, the non-refugee, like supportable board members are able to learn from the refugee board members about culturally um, appropriate practice of governance. And then also our um, refugee board members are giving that community updates and needs assessment and sharing about the like, true needs of the our community here in San Diego, but also um, what's really happening in Burma. That what's happening in Burma truly like a huge impact on the lives of people who are here already. And then, um, so we have this co-officer system that mentoring like very natural mentorship for our board members. And uh, next one is about our interpretation and transport, uh, translation support for all board meeting. So our board meetings are definitely longer than our other typical board meeting because um, some of our board uh, refugee board members don't um, need an interpretation for Korean and Burmese languages. And then, uh, but we do offer that because we really think it's it's critical for all of our board members uh, understand what's going on and then what we are talking about um, during the board meeting. And um, kind of related to that, we also do the prep meeting and additional training opportunity for community board members who are uh, from the refugee community. Meaning, for example, if we have um, the board meeting, entire board meeting is happening the, the end of this month, 
then we're going to have a PEP meeting only for the refugee board members so that um, they truly understand the agenda and what's going to be um, discussed about. Um, especially when we talk about like a financial statement or budget or some new policies or new contract with the government, I really wanted to make sure that the refugee board members truly understand what they are voting for and then what we are talking about. And then, but the, you know, the one board meeting is not enough for um, to truly like for them to truly understand so we do uh, a lot of prep meeting and then also like if they have a difficulty understanding financial statement then we will have additional um, financial statement kind of financial training um, so that they feel more comfortable voting on um, and also another um, practice that we've been doing is annual budget for board and the staff capacity building and retreat this has been very important for us. Um, at the beginning, it was so hard for us to have some budget around capacity building because it was so hard for us to get um, kind of funding that I can we can use for um, kind of strategy planning, capacity building or board or staff training or retreat. But we have amazing, um, great foundation supporters or, and then also um, some of the governing, um, government government, uh, funding also can you know help us with that training capacity vision training for not only for the board but also the staff and then we believe it's very important that board and uh, staff members know each other not just the executive director and board but the entire staff members should know who our board are and then we should have more opportunity to get know each other um so we have um and then we also invite our board members to uh, most of our events and then also um, our board member attend our actual programs like workshop training, community meeting. That way um, staff members know more with the, uh, about the board members and then also our community members also know who are our board members. I think it's very important for us. Um, another thing is uh, utilizing available technical assistance support. Um, so when we first started this organization in 2009, and then first we got the grant from the OR ethnic community self-help, that time our uh, technical assistant provider was uh, Project SOAR. And uh, we used that. Uh, uh, there's a lot of free resources and toolkits. And then we are also request some technical assistant, like one on one. Uh, we utilize as much as possible because uh, we didn't have any other budget. And now um, the switchboard is uh, offering that type of support for ACBOs and uh, other um, refugee service providers. And there's amazing. Um, free uh, resource and a tool. Um, so that was another best practices that uh, we've been utilizing um, to address the challenge that we have. I think I'm going to stop here. And if you have any questions uh, for one of each of us, please uh, leave the question to the Q&A. And now I'm going to pass back to Josela. Uh, Josela, welcome back. And thank you so much doing this with me. Thank you now and uh, Dauda and Kara for excellent presentation and thank you for what you do uh, for the communities you serve because you want to acknowledge you also and your efforts. So for now we will talk about the additional best practices uh, for successful community-led development boards. On the next slide, so we are talking about professional development. It's good to leverage other people resources. And we have free resources in our communities through universities and foundations that can help you to grow, including uh, uh, private donors. I, I remember one of the best things, best gift I got from a private donor who gave me $50,000 when I was an executive director, I was presenting, do I need an extra case manager? Do I need a, a development director? And I presented the development director because I wanted to generate more resources within the organization. So those people are there and those organizations are there to support you. As an example, universities offer uh, board training opportunities and also offer scholarships and non-credit certificates. There are many people who are 
trend overseas, skilled refugees and immigrants sometimes who are coming here and our degrees are not transferable. So if a university gives you a non-credit certificate, you are ready to the American market. It can give you credibility to the American market. Universities also can help your organization crafting, branding, and marketing strategies. As I said before, you have to be visible. You have to make sure that everybody knows about your mission in the community, in the neighborhood, but also locally and nationally. Because even if you are building locally, you get even donations from people from the national level. So make sure that uh, the branding and especially like the University of Tennessee here in Knoxville, they did help us to have those uh, strategies in the branding, in the marketing. And then one of the things I learned from that experience is that having a story-centered branding, and I know this is what you do, it can just take you up to the roof. As I said, the organization I was leading was about to close the doors, but when I used that strategy, I left the organization with $100,000 in reserve. I hope that you have a reserve or you are building up your reserve. So local foundations also offer various training and funding for capacity building. We are talking about strategic planning. So they can sponsor the meetings and even the all the expenses that are related to uh, the capacity building or strategic planning meetings. I have experience in that. And if you need extra help, we are here to help you. On the next slide, we will talk about building relationship. If there is one thing, just one thing you learn and remember about Drusella is building relationship. That will take you and your organization very far. So building relationship within the board, between board and staff, within the community, with uh, refugee settlement agencies. So this is key. And this is non-negotiable. If you want to grow, you better build relationships. Now, I do recommend you to identify existing networks that can build, can help you to build other networks and to diversify funding of sources of funding and resources. One of the challenges every or every other ECBO talked about is about resources and finances. There is money out of there. I hope that you started to think about who has your money because you can list them out, United Way, foundations, private sector, what are other nonprofit churches, faith based or inspired organization, list them out. And then you find out how you share the stories of your uh, achievements, and then you'll get plenty of money in your bank account. So expanding board membership to professionals with newcomers and background. So as other pre pre previous speakers said, the skill gap is there. So we have to find a way to expand the board membership to other people who have those skills, who have close connections with a uh, newcomer, so with resettlement or with refugee or immigrant background. It does work, it does work. So you had the experience from Dauda and from other, so it works. Look around and you'll find those ones. And then if you have to change the bylaws, the bylaws are not static. They can change over the time if you want to fulfill the mission of the, the organization. And then hold the board and staff retreats. And this can be on a yearly basis or depending on the organization and the funds, but it's a, it's a best practice because when you do a strategic planning, it's an evolving document. You can review them on a little bit basis. And then as now said, it does, when you have those meetings, it builds and strengthens the relationship between the board and staff. I have witnessed uh, some board members who didn't know the staff and staff members who did not the board. But when we have like a two day retreat far away in a hotel or motel and you build those relationships and you know about the character. One of the things I did appreciate when we had this kind of uh, board and staff retreat. We did go even to learn about the learning and working styles. Sometimes you do not understand a person 
because you don't understand their, their learning and working style. So this kind of planning meeting can help you to know who is this person, who is this person, why do they act this way? Creating incentives for board members. It's very crucial and you can find a way and recognition. So you can create in those incentives. I did talk about the conferences, but every organization can find a way to give incentives to board members and recognition uh, for them. Organizing social gathering for a purpose, mission and fundraising. Another best practice is like board members, for example, if you have 20 friends, you can call them to a meeting in your house. It doesn't have to be so expensive. They are your friends mostly and they can bring their friends. And then you will talk about the missions of the organization and the needs, and then they will bring the checks. And then your organization will have a way of, uh, of uh, having additional resources and friends. We talk about fundraising and friends rising. Friends, the more friends you make, the more money you get. On the next slide, we will talk about monitoring and evaluation for continuous improvement. You develop the metrics. What do you measure? Those metrics can be qualitative and quantitative. For example, you can say, hey, we will serve this amount of clients. But when you, you are working on building trust, sometimes it's not tangible and measurable, but you will see how the relationship are strong, the collaboration, the creativity, the innovation, build on the trust level of uh, people who are in that community and on the board. So collect feedback in the data from community members. And feedback should not always be positive. They can be also negative. What they help you to go is uh, to reframe and to plan better. And also you can build more relationship with um, the people who are giving you the feedback. Afterwards, you have those meetings and you, you listen to them, why did, this didn't go well. It's a way of giving you an opportunity. Uh, the feedback gives you an opportunity to do well and move forward. Celebrate achievements and share successes story, as we said. Where? Within, you know, you give high five to an employee who did well. Within the board, celebrate. If you did do a good meeting, celebrate. If you have an event, Celebrate and acknowledge people. Social media, celebrate people through social media by sharing the stories, the best employees, the case managers, what they did. So every person yearns to be celebrated and acknowledged. Make sure that you, this is done for the board members, the staff, also for the community you serve. And use the evaluation findings so you can refine, adapt, and adapt board development strategies. So when you evaluate, you say, hey, our plan was this. What did go well? What didn't go well? Or what we have to start or what we have to stop and continue? So those are simple things. You don't have to have a lot of money to go in a hotel. You can just simplify your way of tracking your metrics I'm talking about. So then you can adapt other solutions that will come with that. Continuous improvement, build a culture of continuous improvement based on the community inputs. We talked about adaptability, the flexibility, things change. Wanting change or not, things will happen and then we have to adapt to the situation programmatically, financially, even within our communities. We have to adapt to different situations our communities are going through. So next we'll talk about key elements for a successful, for a community led board. Number one, clear vision and purpose. The, boards, the board sets the bar. They have to have a clear vision where they are going. So how they will serve the community. And I want to tell you this, every board member, every refugee, or any population you are serving, every staff member should have common understanding about the vision and the uh, mission. And you can have it 
on your walls. When you enter into organization, into your website, the vision and the mission are things that is are imperative. And when you do onboarding for the board members and when you give them the folders, the vision and the mission are like twins. They go hand in hand. So everybody should memorize those because when they say, hey, you have just 30 seconds, who you are, what do you do? You have to be able to articulate your vision and the mission. Diverse and inclusive representation. Many people did talk about how inclusion and representation is key to the sustainability of our organization. We need young people. We need elders, we need professionals, we need people with different backgrounds and experiences. So when you have that diversity on the, uh, in the organization, there is more creativity and more innovation. So you can develop and then building sustainable organization all together. And the collaboration also is key when you are building uh, those kind of, who will be on the board, who is, when, when you are recruiting, you have to say, hey, what are the skills we need on the board? A board is not like a club of people who knows each other. So it means you want the skills, you want the representation all combined, and then you will have excess, uh, excellent results. Transparency and communication. You know, the board takes decisions and they are there to help the organization to grow. They have to communicate often uh, the decisions they made and if they are adaptation or something they need on the staff or to serve uh, the community or pivot, all that should be uh, communicated clearly so they can move forward together. When you have that fluent communication, the trust is built and then the collaboration and the engagement level goes high. Defining the roles and responsibility. Each board members should know why are the, on the board, they should uh, be on the committees and also, uh, they should be able to say, hey, this is what I commit to do. And they should have a, a, a evaluation mechanism for them. I know sometimes it is difficult. And, and I, I experienced the case when people were covering others, but the resource that can help you is a nonprofit center of excellence. They can help you to work on those um, metrics. The board has to be accounted for. Uh, and then, uh, when it is said by a third party who is an expert, your uh, uh, responsibility is much easier. Effective leadership. We need great leaders. They say that everything lays on leadership. When you have a great leader, they have a good uh, direction, but also they care about the team, the cohesion, the synergy about the team, that matters. And then the leader has a good representation. Uh, they are the face of the organization in the community. So they need to be seen also in the, they have to present, uh, to represent the organization and the achievement they are having. Strategic planning. I did talk about this a little bit. So it's essential. So if you have a two, three year plan, every year you have to move and evaluate and see how you are achieving the goals uh, you set, and then you have to adjust. Also, when you do strategic planning, there is client evidence-based best, best practices that are coming up. What your clients need, if there is a, a change in the, in the needs of the clients, you just have to adapt. Accountability and evaluation. Everybody should be accountable at the level where you are. And then you have the mechanism of saying, hey, if you didn't do your role, this is what we were talking about, supervising and evaluating the ED, same. Board members should be accountable to each other. And then, you know, we have financial responsibility. We have uh, fiduciary responsibility. All this should go hand in hand to make sure that uh, legally, ethically, we are okay. Conflict resolution. As I said, conflicts are a regular, normal, natural process. We have to have them in order to, to manage uh, the situation. Somebody was talking about how even sometimes in our communities, based on ethnical division we have, from back home, sometimes they follow us because we didn't hear from the trauma. We have to make sure that we have the conflict resolution policies within the boards, but also help our community how to have unity and reconciliation between themselves. Recognition and appreciation, it's huge. 
you and I need to be appreciated. So are the staff member, are the board members, and even our donors. You know, you, you write thank you note from every don donation you are getting. And then when you have events, even you recognize the donors there. Legal, ethical, and compliance. Board members have that responsibility to make sure that they are compliant with laws and regulations in the bylaws. And as I said, the bylaws are not static. They can change, they can adapt the bylaws, but compliance is key for every board members, staff, and, um, and the uh, members we serve. I want to say that even if board members are volunteers, you know they have a requirement for nonprofit, for example, to uh, track the hours because it will go to uh, the financial reports at the end of the year. So all those parameters that are needed the board are responsible for those ones. Now, back to you. Thank you so much, Josela. Um, I before going to the Q and A, I would like to uh, go over what we learned today together. Uh, first of all, success for community-led board development is an ongoing process. I hear from Kara, Doda, and then. We try many different ways and then uh, we always try to learn how to improve our board and um, so it's ongoing process and case study shows how directly engaging communities in leadership help better achieve meaningful and lasting impact and the lastly benefits of a community-led board make the challenges worth addressing it is definitely you know we have a lot of challenges but of course it's worth addressing because um, this is the ethnic community-based organizations for our community. And then it is very, very important to involve our community members themselves to our um, organizational governance. Um, go to the next slides. Um, before I almost go into the Q&A and then I think um, there's a lot of question came and then already answered by a uh, typed answer, but we will go over a couple of answer um, questions. Um, but before that, I want to talk about little strategies for connecting with other ECBO. Uh, first thing uh, about like a schedule study tours to visit other ECBO. It doesn't need to be super formal, but if you know other um, ECBOs in your same city or state, you might want to communicate with them and then to visit them. Maybe you can bring your board members, um, staff members to the visit and then to meet with other ECBO leaders and then learn from their experience and then different practices that they might be using. And then you, you can also share your uh, challenges and then best practices so that other organizations can learn from you. Uh, maybe you can do like your other states, like a bigger study tour. Um, that might be a good opportunity for uh, you to connect with other SPOs. Um, and share resources, other ECBOs. I've been seeing many ECBOs working together, collaborating together to apply for funding, doing the projects together. I'm really enjoying uh, working with other ECBO actually uh, for San Diego as well. And uh, whenever you see any good uh, funding resources, or uh, the board training or capacity building training resources. I think it's amazing that if you can share with other ECBOs so that we can learn together, we can grow together and then we sustain our organization together for our communities. And lastly, I would like to mention about our switchboards, uh, community of practice for ECBO leader, which is happening every month now. Um, I'm gonna put a little bit more information in the chat later but uh, we are having monthly meeting with the ECBO leaders. It's a safe, um, unique space that you can meet with other ECBO leaders. And then we talk about many different topics, our challenges, and then we learn from each other. Um, it is happening last Tuesday of each month. And then I will share how to register for that space. But that's another way for you to meet with the new ECBOs. Um, there's a lot of different tools nowadays, um, like a website, social media. You can, you know, find like a new ECBO leaders and then you can just simply email them, call them to ask questions and try to connect. That'd be great um, way to connect each other. And then today, Doda and Kara join us today. And then I really appreciate your 
uh, inputs and sharing your challenges and then best practices. If you wanna connect with them, please do so. And I'm happy to get connected with you as well. Okay, I think we have a time, um, little time for the Q and A. Um, let me go over. Um, there are a couple of questions that already came in earlier. Um, so first of all, um, maybe Tara already answered. But if any of you, maybe Dota, um, have any thing to share, like what challenges have you faced when working with your community? Maybe tension between community members or misunderstanding about the purpose of the grant or elder youth leadership transition onboarding. Um, do you have any strategy that you wanted to share? <clears throat> or Kala, you can talk about what you said here too. Oh yeah, so um, I I put um, in the Q and A session, but I'm happy to uh, elaborate on that one. Um, so there was one question uh, specifically uh, meant for me. I think I would like to begin from there. Um, and then go back to the general questions. So the question is about uh, in partnering with the universities. So uh, as for BCAP, what we did was um, we reached out to um, a department in um, at the University of Pittsburgh uh, that offers um, you know nonprofit leadership um, certification courses. And then you know it so happens that they are looking for the department looks uh, for opportunities to engage their students uh, with uh, community organizations so it is a two-way um, help we get consultants uh, for free uh, while they get a space uh, to to complete their project so it that worked very well with us so the the two students we got from um, the master's uh, level students um, they helped us you know, refine our uh, our organization's uh, vision and mission uh, and mission statements, and then also they hosted um, our first uh, board retreat. So that was a um, awesome fac facilitation. Uh, it worked very well. It should work uh, well for for the rest of uh, the community members too. Thank you so much, Kara. And next yes. questions. Uh, go ahead, Dora. Sorry. Um. Um. Thank you. Um. That's a beautiful question. If have you experienced any tension in working with others? Um. I won't call it tension. It's I'll just say it's a diverse opinion. Um. Because when you are recruiting board members. Um, you're recruiting diff people with different skill sets and uh, with different upbringing, with different background, and you're coming together to focus mm -hmm. on the mission and objective of the organization. And, and that is the key. But, um, but the mission and objective of the organization, that is a process. Some individuals are just coming in or maybe because they want to serve on the board for their resume or other things. And, and some are just coming in, forgot that as a board member, you have a fiduciary responsibility as a governance. Um, so all of those little things comes into play and those tensions are there. And that is the reason why as a founder and the CEO that drive the mission every day, you just won't have to educate yourself as knowing that, hey, <laughs> you are recruiting people to hold you accountable. <laughs> and that's the first thing. <laughs> yeah, you are recruiting people to hold you accountable, even though you found it. So you have to know that. And then secondly as well, I like Drusilla mentioned, board also supposed to be accountable to one another as a collective. We are asked, if you're coming in, the mission and objective, instead of sitting there and just saying, hey, this is what needs to be done, how can you transition from becoming an active board and working board members? And then secondly, yes, there are conflicts. Don't be shy to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the board and then try to redirect that individual focus. Number one, what's the purpose first? And 
there is a board commitment, always have that. And then also the purpose why they join initially, once they fill that form, have that one-on-one -on -one meeting with the board and try to redirect the focus and remind them of the responsibility they signed up for. And every time that is the worst part, but if their um, participation is not aligned with the mission and objective of the organization, then, then yeah, we can offer them an opportunity to serve in other area. Maybe serving on the board is not the best option for them at this moment, but they can become a community members or community partner, or they can serve in other areas as well. So sometimes it's that last resort, but it is necessary for you to drive the organization moving forward. So that's what I just wanted to add. Thank you, Dora. And maybe Josella wanted to add. Thank yes. you, Josella. Thank you. Now, I will be brief. I experienced those kind of tension and conflicts. But the reason why they uh, occurred is that the, the expectations were not clear set. So for a nonprofit or ECBOs, the members should know the laws and the regulation in a simplified way. So when the money comes to the organization, what does it, it's not just dividing the money. It will go towards programs and paying the staff. But in one organization, I saw that some members were thinking that when they get donations and money, it will be spread among members. So I think setting expectation and explaining the role of a nonprofit or ECBO organization to members is very crucial. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to just do one more question and then maybe very briefly. I think uh, one of the questions was about involving the youth leaders uh, on the board. And then I share that uh, during my pres um, presentations that I, our one of the challenge was involving youth on the board. And if anyone wanted to answer the questions quickly, maybe one minute. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Oh, if I can come into this, um. When we at Lowry, uh, we have what we call a youth ambassador, a youth wing. And, and at the board, we just said, hey, the, the, the youth is not just the present, but they are the future leaders of tomorrow. So it's very critical to encourage them in the board. Yes. And, and then one thing that we discuss at the board is, yes, even though we have the youth ambassador, they lead their own platform, their rules are there, but then encourage the leaders to be in the board meetings as well, so that they know how the board is governed and how you run the meeting, so that learnings will be transferred as well when they are leading the youth. So yes, it's definitely critical and crucial to include the youth in decision making. Um, I, th I think in, in uh, many cases, youth are very skeptical about uh, their uh, potential to, to serve and um, contribute to the organization. So it will be on the board, president, board um, secretary, or even the executive director to identify some youths, um, you know, just instill uh, the strength in them, give them the opportunity, invite them to sit um, as a guest on a board meeting. Um, they will gain some confidence and soon uh, you'll see them expressing interest to come back. Um, I had this experience here. Uh, we had a high school graduate um, who um, volunteered as a high school student and um, how many years later? Um, I, I think about eight years or eight or so years later, she is serving on our, uh, uh, on our board as a board secretary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dora and Kara. And then I think our time is running up. And then so when I go to the next one, very quick um, survey. Uh, the slide question again, today's takeaway, what is your next step after today's webinar? What you want to bring to your own organization or your work with the community after today's um, the webinar? I know we don't have much time to, uh, but I, if I can hear from someone, that'd be really great. <clears throat> yeah, I know. Takes time <laughs> to do this, right? I see they are typing. Yeah, I see people are typing on yeah. the developed relationship. Thank you so much, including our professions as a part of our board. 
Uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for sharing Be Visible, uh, setting board expectations early, understand more about board members, take their key responsibility, relationship, youth involvement. These are all so good. And then again, I'm sorry that we are running late. Uh, so I'm going to go to the next one. But I hope that everybody has some takeaway from today and then use some you know, practices you learned today at your organizations. I'm going to skip this one because I went over the objective. And then now um, the survey, um, if you can, you know, um, I we will share that um, the survey uh, link in the chat. And then, um, so I know you don't have a time right now, but if you can uh, use, you know, this link and then um, help us to share your inputs to improve ourselves. Uh, and then um, that's going to be really help. Let's see. I can do this. So, there we go. Um, this is really helpful. Okay, I have to finish now. Um, it's going to be three questions. And then this is a recommended resources. I uh, Hopefully we can share. Um, we're going to share the slides with you um, by tomorrow. So you have access to this. This is another good um, switchboard resource that you can use to develop your own board to advance your organization's mission. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And then the last slide for more training and technical assistance, they connect it with switchboard and email us, or uh, you can follow our social media to get more information about our future webinar. I hope some of you can join our community practice happening every month and then also connect with us. Um, again, on behalf of all of us at the switchboard, thank you so much for learning with us today. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much, everyone, and all the speakers. Thank you, Josela, Cara, Doda, you're amazing. And thank you everyone for joining today. Have a good day. Thank you and bye everyone. Bye everyone.